Hello and welcome to our end of July update from the Wealthy Doctor Institute, intelligent investing for the busy professional. We focus on simple battle-tested methods of investing that require just one adjustment each month to protect and build wealth. Hi, I'm David Ye, author of my book, The Busy Doctor's Investment Guide, how one adjustment per month can save and maintain your portfolio's health. Although the strategies in this book are easy to calculate and adjust each month, for those who are new to the concepts in this book, or for those who are new to investing in general, this video will try to clarify what I do every month. Feel free to follow along every month until you get the hang of it. This month will cover our question of the month. I love getting these questions and I love just how looking at some basic data, we can smash assumptions and conventional wisdom. Then we'll update what's going on with the 20 month moving average system, and then review our adjustments for the MRI system. Then we'll go over the rules for the 25% trailing loss strategy for stock tips. So the question of the month, what's with these target retirement funds? Just because there's so many out there, these funds are also called target date funds, life cycle funds, and now there are robo funds where computers individualize your holdings and rebalance according to your age. I know some investment advisors out there are kind of worried that these robo funds will take away the advisor jobs, but I'm not worried. The way these funds work is that you first choose a target year, such as a year you plan or wish you can retire, or some other benchmark, such as the year your kid goes to college. And the farther away the target year, the more stocks the fund holds and the less bonds, and the closer you are to the target year, the fund will hold less stocks and more bonds. There is no standard way to manage these funds. So the concept is this. If this blue line represents how stocks have done over the last 12 years, and the red line represents how bonds have done over the last 12 years, knows how stocks can go up a lot, but can also go down a lot. Whereas with bonds, or not fluctuating quite so much, doesn't do as well as stocks over the long term. In the beginning, the fund might actually allocate more of your funds into stocks to take advantage of growth. So theoretically, you could lose more as well, but that's okay because you have more time to make up losses. As the funds approach the target date, theoretically the pie gets bigger and they put you more into bonds than stocks. So first we'll clip some misconceptions about these funds. People actually assume that they can't lose money on these schemes. I'm going to show you how that's so wrong. People assume there's a guaranteed rate of return. Far from it. In fact, if you look at how volatile both stocks and bond funds can be, you can see how volatile target funds can be. And of course, people think that just by throwing money at these funds until a target date, that's when they can retire. That was never the intention of these funds. All they're designed to do is satisfy some theoretical asset allocation model and then claim that they're keeping you safe by optimizing the standard of care, then justify the sophisticated asset management by charging higher fees. And then there are the assumptions. It's cost effective. Really? Look at our prospectuses of most of these companies. Except for a few families such as Vanguard, fees are typically higher. Bonds are safe. Bonds can go up, bonds can go down. Holding an individual bond until maturity is relatively safe because you typically don't sell bonds once you buy them. You just hold on for dividends until the bond matures. So you know exactly how much you're getting in the future. A bond fund, however, doesn't have a set maturity date and bond funds can also lose value. Bonds move in opposite directions to stocks. That's how funds get safer, especially during stock market crashes. Really? We'll take a look at the data. And the glide path. Ah, oh, well, we all think there's a smooth transition from when we get in until a target date. But boy, oh boy. So robo portfolios are basically target funds tailored to an individual investor. But how tailored is it? I went to one of the robo portfolio websites, plugged in my age, stated I want to retire in 25 years, and then for one set of data, for all the questions about risk tolerance, I made it sound like I was some kind of 
weak, lily-livered, mousy, meeky guy. I got assigned 61% stocks and 39% non-stocks. Okay. When I plugged in risk tolerance answers that made them think that I was some kind of death wish daredevil when it came to investing, it signed me 69% stocks, 31% non-stocks. Now, a note about these percentages. Yes, traditional pie chart investing such as 60-40 stocks, bonds, or 70-30% stocks, bonds. Every day, there's going to be some variations. Stocks go up one day, bonds go down, or maybe they both go up the same direction, only stocks went down more so. The percentages will change, even day to day, and they may change more than 1%. Does that mean that, practically speaking, if you really want to do the pie chart thing, you're supposed to rebalance to within 1% of each category? Heck no. Trading costs such as commissions and slippage will chew up your account if you trade so often. There's usually a band of tolerance. In other words, if a 60-40 portfolio became a 70-30 portfolio, then maybe that would be time to rebalance. Maybe. If you've read my book or have been following my videos so far, you know how I feel about pie charting investing in general. I don't use them. But this would be the dilemma of most people trying to pie chart invest. So when the robo portfolio spits up percentages down to the half percentage, I have to laugh. So how do we sort this all out? Well, if you're a numbers guy like me, well, of course, backtest. Use actual historical dividend corrected data and see if any interesting patterns emerge. And yes, I'm using Vanguard funds again for two very good reasons. One, Vanguard funds are in general low cost. So most of the fluctuations you see in the data are mostly due to market variance than due to Vanguard sorting away fees. And number two, Vanguard pioneers these index funds and hybrid funds, therefore I get more data to backtest. Even then, Vanguard's target date funds only go back to October 27, 2003. So we're only looking at 12 years of data. Statistically, not a lot of data, especially if we're supposedly planning for 25, 35, or even 45 years in the future. But here are the two benchmarks. For stocks, the blue line, we're using Vanguard's total stock market index fund. And for bonds, the red line, we're using the Vanguard's total bond market index fund. These are about as broad based as you can get while still staying within our nation's borders. Plus, Vanguard supposedly uses these funds to adjust their own target funds. This yellow green line is Vanguard's balance index fund, where they hold pretty close to 60% stock, 40% bonds. If you like 60%, 40% stock bond mixtures, instead of buying a stock fund and a bond fund and then rebalancing yourself, you will only have to buy this one balance index fund and Vanguard would automatically rebalance for you. So here's how it performs. During the first four years, from 2003 to 2007, it doesn't do as well as stocks, the blue line, but it doesn't do as badly as bonds, the red line. Makes sense. Remember with any pie chart, the pie chart only does the average of the funds. So it protects you from doing as badly or worse than the worst fund, but it also protects you from doing as well or better than the best fund. And if you look at the market crash from 2007 to a low of February 2009, stocks lost 50.9%, whereas the balanced index fund only lost 32.6%. And then as stocks turned up, overall stock averages averaged 8.5% annualized from 2003 until now, bonds 4.4% annualized, and the 60-40 mix 7.2% annualized. So these three will be our index benchmarks. In order to measure how our system performs, we need something to compare. So here's our ruler with three gradations to measure. So here are our data from target date funds. This purple line represents the 2045 target date fund. This azure blue line represents a 2015 target date fund. So yes, this date fund would theoretically end this year if you wanted to retire or had some other kind of target. So again, looking at the first four years from 2003 to 2007, the longer term 2045 fund is more heavily weighted in stocks, 
so it does about as well as stocks, while the 2015 target date fund has more bonds and behaves more like the 60-40 balance index fund. During the market tumble between 2007 and 2009, guess what? They both tumbled along with them. And now if you look at about 2012, you see that the purple 2045 fund starts to underperform stocks because it's beginning to rotate more into bonds, whereas the azure blue 2015 target date fund is beginning to peel away from the green balance index fund. Again, because the 2015 fund is also rotating more into bonds. Bottom line, even though target date funds rebalance more conservatively the closer you get to a target date, they perform more like pie charts in the long term. And like any other pie chart, they can lose money, setting back years trying to recapture losses. Proponents of the target date funds would have you believe that you get more growth and more risk in the beginning and less risk towards the target date. But why not deal more directly with mitigating risk to begin with? That's the whole basis of my investment systems. So we'll start with a 20-month moving average system, a system with only one rule. If the price of the S&P 500 index fund is above the 20-month moving average, it is relatively safe to stay invested in an index fund. Otherwise, get out. This one rule more directly deals with market risk than pie investing. So here's an updated graph. Last month, the stocks took a bit of a tumble, but now it's back up a bit again. The 20-month moving average is now 181.48 compared to the end of month price of 194.32 of the VFI index, which is the ticker symbol of the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund. And if you do the quickie math, you see that there is a 7.1% cushion that means if the index fund falls more than 7.1% by the end of the month, we get out next month. Right now, we're above this line, so it's relatively safe to stay in stocks for this month. The 181.48 number is the how do we know we're wrong number. The only reason I provide a cushion number is because for those of you who are just beginning to use this system, you get an idea of how much you could lose if the stock market started to crash. Here we get another one of those 50% crashes. It would take months for the crash to complete. Meanwhile, people who buy, hold, and pray will keep holding onto the positions as the markets tank. But you and I will be out of the month the index falls below the 20-month moving average. And now our second system, the MRI, or the Monthly Rotation Investment System. This system only has two rules. Each month, rank the three mutual funds in order of performance, then sell the bottom 25% of our portfolio and buy the top fund. And to do so this month, here are this month's rankings. The blue line is the S&P 500 index fund, VFINX, which I use to calculate. I actually use the SPY ETF. which this month actually gained 2%, which of course the inverse fund lost a little bit more than 2%. And the emerging markets this month fell 6.8%. So for us, we would sell the bottom 25% of our portfolio and buy the S&P 500 index fund. Again, I actually buy the SPY ETF and do not actually buy the VFI index mutual fund unless, of course, this was in some kind of retirement scheme where they only offer mutual funds. So for the current model, for last month, we were half in the inverse fund and half in the S&P 500 index fund. If we were to sell the bottom 25%, we would sell one unit of the inverse fund and buy the S&P 500 index fund. So we would end up with 25% inverse fund 75% index fund. And since one inverse fund effectively cancels one index fund, last month we were 100% in cash. This month we would be half cash, half index fund. Now here's a nuance. 
If you notice, each month, if the VFI index went up, the inverse fund went down a little bit more. If the inverse fund went up, the index fund went down a little bit more. Why is this? It's just another mathematical law about why losses are so devastating. When we lose 10%, we need to make up 11% just to break even. If we lose 25%, we need to make 33% to break even. And if we lose 50%, we need to make 100% to break even. So if we lose 1%, we need to make up 1.01% to break even. So if one of our funds goes up 1%, but the counterpart goes down 1%, the loss is larger than you think, and it adds up over time and results in a downward drift. That's one reason to favor cash anytime you have both a long and short position canceling each other out. So anyway, according to our model, this month's winner is the S&P 500 index fund, so we sell 25% of our portfolio, the index, the inverse fund, and we use the proceeds to buy the S&P 500 index fund. And just to go over the trailing stop loss method for buying an individual stock on a stock tip or stock rumor, again, if you're buying stock, monitor at least very, every week and keep ratcheting up the stop loss order if your brokerage doesn't already do that automatically. And if the stock goes up 33%, remember to buy more. So in this month's video, I addressed the question I'm often asked about target date funds and target date systems. If you look under the hood, the rebalancing system with the glide scale, it doesn't really improve that much more upon the static pie chart designs, with basically the same weaknesses as in any other pie chart system. The weaknesses boil down to how pie charts only indirectly deal with market risk, whereas I just updated you on three different ways to mitigate risk more directly, namely with a 20-month moving average system, the MRI system, and the stop loss system used to deal with stock tips. No system is perfect, but a system that passes backtesting and scrutiny has a higher chance of succeeding than our default invest from the hip approach. Keep those questions coming. I know I talk to several of you personally each month, but for those of you who only heard about me indirectly, maybe you got a copy of this video forwarded to you by a well-meaning friend or colleague, here are ways to get in touch with me. And until next month, invest safely.